Welcome to It's Happening in Grand Prairie. I'm Georgia Clemson, and we have a great show for you today. And we're going to start off with a great guest, Sylvia Salazar from Public Works Department. Welcome, Sylvia. Hello. How so are you? Doing great. It's <laughs> great to have you today. Thank you. And I know that you have some very good information for our viewers today. It's hot. It's summertime, and we want to be water smart, don't we? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. Well, tell us what we can do to get smarter. Well, uh, Water Smart is a public works campaign that educates residents on how to be uh, cautious about conserving water and also how to save on your water bill. And some of the ways that we can uh, save on our water bill and uh, conserve water is to follow the water restrictions of course which is no watering between 10 and 6 p.m. and also uh, knowing when you're supposed to water depending on your address like for instance uh, if your address ends in an even number like four then you would water on Mondays and Thursdays yes. and if it ends in an odd number then you would water on Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, Sylvia <clears throat> I do water on Mondays and Thursdays, so awesome. when's the best time of day to water? Anytime before 10 a.m. or anytime mm -hmm. after 6 p.m. because anytime in between mm -hmm. the water is pretty much just going to evaporate and so it's not going to benefit your lawn. So even if I have to start at 3 a.m. Yes, to finish by 10, do that. Correct. And we can conserve. Great. That's yes. good advice. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And what else do we have? Uh, we also have uh, just information about checking your sprinkler system make sure you have no uh, broken heads sprinkler heads if those are <coughs> broken make sure you replace them or repair them uh, because that uh, saves a lot of money a tremendous amount of money on your water bill uh, of course you don't want a geyser shooting out of your lawn you know so it needs to be repaired right away so um, also certain rain sensors that were made after 2009 require uh, sensors on them so that they can determine when it's going to rain or snow or ice and things like that so they don't turn on. And also, I just want to mention that thorough but infrequent watering is the best bet for your lawn. It will create deeper roots mm -hmm. and you'll have a healthy lawn that will survive through the summer where frequent watering will uh, result in shorter roots I see. and then you know your lawn doesn't do so well. So it's, you're better off to uh, make the length of watering longer. Correct. Yes, And less frequent. Yes, ma'am. And one way to check is to get a screwdriver mm -hmm. and stick it in the lawn. And if it's hard to stick in the lawn, like a six to eight inch screwdriver, mm -hmm. then it's time to water. Or you can also use a moisture meter which is also has the same effect and then you stick it in the lawn and then it will actually mm -hmm. it has a little reader and it will tell you if it needs water or not and where so. do you get those you can buy them pretty much anywhere home depot lowe's uh any hardware store and or about how much are they about 15 15 ish 15 dollars so it yes, would be a good investment to keep on hand yes ma'am yes ma'am and well what else can i do uh you know i'm interested not only in conserving water but saving money. Um, I know that the water department has certain levels. If you use over cer a certain amount, right. tell us a little about right. that if you have that information. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's called our three or our tiered billing structure uh, deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, and so what you can do is anybody who uses 3,000 or less gallons, that's our lifeline. That's pretty much uh, older residents living alone. And so of course they save the most money but of course don't forget that you also have your fixed rates which include your uh, trash bill you know like your recycling and trash right and then there's the uh, strained the drainage storm fees mm -hmm. and then there's the garbage tax and so that uh, adds up to about forty six dollars approximately that's you'll always see on your bill per right. month you know monthly so a lot of times we get um, inquiries and maybe complaints regarding their water bill uh, right. being so high in the summertime and of course we're using more water Correct. and uh, 
along with that, if we happen to go over the level, our rate increases as well. Is that correct? That is correct because we have three tiers. Of course, a lifeline and then there's tier one, which is anywhere from uh, like above the 3,000 through 20,000 gallons. Mm -hmm. And there's, that's a certain rate and it's 385 per gallon. Mm -hmm. And then of course you have tier two, uh, which is really somebody that's not conserving and maybe not paying attention to their sprinkler system. And that can cost as high as 663. So Which it's um, a lot of the responsibility comes to the homeowner correct. to take care and maintain their sprinkler and be aware on their con conservation. Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Well, those are good tips for us, uh, Sylvia. Do you have any others for us to be water smart? Or is, does that pretty well cover it? Is if you're unfamiliar with like how much water to you know give your lawn, uh, one deal would be to get a tuna can or like an empty uh, cat food can, yes. make sure it's clean of course, mm -hmm. and set it on your lawn, turn on your sprinkler, and check it every 15 minutes. And it should take about 30 minutes to fill one inch. And so that determines how much water you need. And if you want to do thorough watering, you have to water for you know anywhere about six to eight inches for deep watering. And so that tells you how much to water. So like one inch, 30 minutes, you know, and you go from there. So those are good practical tips for yes, all of us. Yes. Good ways we can measure and conserve. We don't want to get the um, surprise water bill, do exactly, we? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And if you do happen to get a bill that's really high and you didn't have any type of um, changes to your watering, yes. then what you may want to do is go ahead and call our customer service number at 972-237-8200 and have them go over your water bill and they can see uh, now with some of our AMI meters that have yes. been installed in some locations, they can tell hourly where that jump was and they can help you with that and determine if you have a leak or not. And I've heard that the main culprit is leaks in their sprinkler system. Yes, ma'am. So they yes. should get that checked out as well yes. if there's a big jump. That is correct. Good information, mm -hmm. Sylvia. Thank you so much for helping us be water smart in Grand Prairie. Well, thank you for having me. Of course. And we'll be right back. Live out grand in Grand Prairie. We can build a family together, play in harmony. It doesn't matter who you are. Here you are, a shining star, making future plans. Live out grand. Can we live like in Grand Prairie? Welcome back, and welcome to one of our favorite guests, our fire chief, Robert Fite, and he has a guest as well today, <laughs> our favorite chief code compliance man. Okay. <laughs> We're glad to have Steve Collins here, too. It's good to be here. Um, we know we have something going on that our viewers and citizens need to know about. Chief, would you go into it for us? Sure. We, we help team with, with the code to do a, a program called 14 feet high, let us buy. Uh, and it's really a, a, a problem thing that deals with our more established neighborhoods, mm -hmm. Nottingham, Pecan Acre, some of those that have a lot of trees that can potentially block our taller uh, fire apparatus as we're going down the road. It also comes into play with school buses, trash trucks, really anything that's a little bit higher than just your normal car that the tree limbs actually cause us a lot of damage on our apparatus. Yes, and slow you down too when you're it trying to It does slow us somewhere. down, and what, what you got to understand on the top of all of our, our rigs, if you will, mm -hmm. are the uh, antennas for not only cell phone, but radio, very expensive LED lighting, and there's actually some specialized equipment up that we keep up, in, up, up high that it can get actually just ripped off so we can't even communicate via radio or cell phone to the other apparatus. So I know, you know, our citizens and our, our visitors we love our beautiful trees. I yes. live in Nottingham, as oh, you well know. Yes. We love our huge trees. Uh, but when they encroach over the roadway and they're less than 14 feet tall uh, to let our clearance, it becomes a problem. And that's when we turn to our friends of code to try yes. to help us out. Yes. And this ordinance is in place, isn't it, already? It is in place. It's yes. a 14-foot uh, ordinance clearance that we need to have 
uh, of the roadway. And um, Mr. Collins, why haven't we been enforcing that recently? You were saying something earlier about we had trimmed the trees and now they're back, or what is that? Well, we it's, it's been on an ordinance for quite some time. What we found is at the time it was 12 feet. And in my research with other cities, uh, they have all gone to 14 feet high because of the added additional height on uh, vehicles or trucks. Uh, as, as Chief was saying with fire, uh, trash trucks, or even um, mail trucks, or even delivery trucks in the community. Mm -hmm. We found that we needed to increase our ordinance in order to have that clearance. Yes, yes. Uh, and it sounds like it's very, very important to our fire department because of the equipment, like you said, ex very expensive equipment. Yeah, very expensive equipment, and it's, it's also communication equipment. And if we can't communicate amongst ourselves, letting everybody know what the situation is on the scene, not to mention it does slow us down. Right. Uh, you know, during the day, a lot of times we can see the problem and we can go a little slower and avoid it. But at night, we can't see the canopy of the trees. And we just have to hope that our residents have, have taken care of their end and have them trimmed to that 14-foot level. And it is uh, up to the property owner to have their trees trimmed. Is that to do it themselves or have that done? Is that, that correct? That is correct. We do find that, that, is, that is responsibility of the homeowner. However, we do find where people who lease homes also uh, need to be responsible too. So we try to bring them both into the picture of this importance and, and take care of it in a timely manner. And uh, sometimes we do have cases, I know, where people are having a problem. Um, maybe they're just unable to do that. Do we have any help for them or any, th any way we can We are them? looking at putting together a volunteer group that can assist those who are not physically, physically able, able. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and need that assistance. So we, we're not out to just be uh, hammering people to right. do it. We want to make it a, a friendly approach, but we do ask people to be uh, cognizant that when my code officers go out and make an approach to talk to them about or give them some type of notification, take the time frame in which we cite to take care of it. If they do not have the means or ways of doing it, if they are elderly citizens or d d disabled mentally or not challenged, they're challenged right. physically to do it, then let us know. Not let the, uh, the notice sit and expire and then we end up having to issue a, a citation. Yes. That's something we would like to avoid doing. And communication is so very important. And I'm so glad that you all are here, that we can communicate to our citizens that this needs to be done and it's very important. Very important. As well as when you communicate with them. Correct, yes. That they need to respond. Yes. We need to hear from them. Usually it's after we've issued the citation and then they go to the court and then the court calls to Steve, this citizen, this property owner, was not able to do it, but we would like to have heard from them prior to that. That way we could have seek, seeked out some help or some assistance for them. So you generally, your code officers generally go out and speak to someone about it, maybe give them a warning. How does that work? Uh, first, yes, we do. We, we knock on doors. We don't just issue a notice and walk away. It has always been our practice to knock on the door to reach a citizen in their home. If they're home at the time, talk to them, explain to them, educate them on the ordinance and then let them know there is a time frame in which it needs to be done. If at that point they just say that I'm not able to, then we can assist them then. And we hope that they at least call us if they're not home within that time frame because my officer's gonna come back for a re-inspection. If they see that it hasn't been done and we have not received any communication, then we feel like they're ignoring us and then we have to follow the next step. And yes. That is to issue the citation. Yes. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. It is the next step. Right. And um, so, Chief, we are, is there anything else we're doing to educate the um, citizens, or is there any other way we can help you reach out to them to let them know what's going well, on? Well, you know, when, when our fire officers see this, often we'll stop mm -hmm. and just knock on the door, exactly like Steve said, and just remind them that, hey, we, we, we can't really get our fire engine down the street and see if they, we can help. We've been hitting it with social media quite a bit 
Facebook and some of the other social media okay. sites just to get the word out, you know, nextdoor.com and all those. Uh, so it, it, communicating across 190,000 people is a challenge. Almost 190,000 yes. people yes. is a challenge. It and is. So the good thing is we know this is an isolated uh, issue with our more established neighborhoods. Yes. Correct. And so they're the ones we're really trying to reach out to. Well, it is a very important thing, and I'm so glad that you all were here to help explain it to our viewers. Sure. And we know that there are some citizens out there who really like to help the city, and they would like to uh, volunteer, turn, volunteer yes. to help and yes. turn in information mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, maybe regarding this. How would they do that? If somebody sees low-hanging branches, it may not be on their property. How would they do well, that? Well, you know, the, the city has this new app for those who love smartphones. Correct. Yes. The My GPTX that mm -hmm. you can actually take a picture and send it right to the right department. Uh, city really would like to see more people use that. I use it personally when I'm driving down yeah. Yeah. and see something broke. I'll just send it, take a picture and send it. I think that's one of the better ways. Uh, but if they're not technology savvy right. or don't want to do that, phone call, email, anything to the city hall to city, city hall, hall and yes. it'll get diverted to the right people cool. perfect yeah. mm -hmm. well i think you all have done a great job of <clears throat> well, informing you. us and thank you so much for being here we want to keep the main point is keeping all of our citizens safe right. as safe as possible correct, correct? Yes. exactly thank you again for you being yes. here thank you. Welcome back, and we welcome our next guest, Ms. Libby Clausen with the Grand Prairie Arts Council. It's great to see you, Libby. Thank you so much, Georgia. It's great to be here. Yes, we've missed you well, thank recently. You. Yes. So we're glad to have you back and to give us an update. Yes, we're so excited with the hot summer coming to a close. We're looking toward our fall events and we want folks to know now is the time to enter our annual juried art show. Any artist 18 and up and it's an amateur show. So any level of art, if you've entered a show, a lot of times we'd love to have you. If you're brand new to art, we'd love to have you. It's a really great show. Uh, you can get all the information on our website, artsgp.org and you can do it all online this year. I've set it up so that your whole entry can be done online instead of having to mail things back and forth. Yes, that's So wonderful. we're doing it a little different this year, so I'm hoping to introduce folks to that. And then it'll make the process much easier for everyone once we get that going. But you have until August 21st. An artist can enter up to three pieces, and it's a $35 entry fee. The only requirement is that they be 18 and over. And we do it now. We host it at the Uptown Theater in the Art Gallery Lobby. That's a great place, a great location to have that. It's really a beautiful show. And what we love now, we'll have our opening ceremony and awards on September 17th. And the show will hang until October 21st. Oh, wow. So we'll be there for a whole month. And we have our fall production during that time, which this year we're doing Sweeney Todd. So our audiences from Sweeney Todd will get to see the art exhibit as well. And then everything else that Doug always plugs in over there at the Uptown, anytime there's anyone there, they'll be exposed to it too. Yes, and it's always beautiful. Thank you. Have you. Some very nice pieces last year and the winners were outstanding and do they get any prizes? We have three thousand dollars in prize money. We oh. usually have six or seven categories so it's it's good prize money, hundreds of dollars to the winners and then of course we have a best of show so we give away a total of three thousand dollars. And you usually have quite a few entries, don't you? We do. We usually have about 50 artists, about 125 pieces of artwork. And we're real excited. We've introduced a digital media category. We had a lot of folks entering that type of work off the computer, digitally mastered. And we didn't know where to put it, so we created a separate category. And we're hoping to really grow that part of the art show for artists that come at at visual arts from a different viewpoint. Oh, that is exciting. You have your traditional categories as well, and 
I believe last year, did you have pottery? We do, we put that in our 3D category. Lots of pottery, fused glass pieces, anything you can imagine that is not 2D, we'll put in our 3D category. Well, that is wonderful. I'm looking forward to that, Libby. Now tell us what else we have to look forward to. Well, before our uh, juried art show entries are due, we are coming up on auditions for our fall production of Sweeney Todd. We have auditions August the 10th and the 12th. And we actually scheduled auditions this year, and we already have 84 people who are coming to audition. But we don't want people to be discouraged by that. We will take walk-ins. If you go online and see that we're full with sign-ups, you are welcome to see what times that we're auditioning and come in and walk in, and we will fit you into the auditions. Uh, we would love folks from all over the community. This is going to be a more adult production as mm -hmm. people know the story of Sweeney mm -hmm. Todd. Uh, we're hoping to have a really large cast and everyone's real excited. This is real operatic music. We have a wonderful production staff put together that's already really excited about this and already thinking way ahead. And who's our director? Dr. Denise Rodriguez, oh, our good. director. Good. And one of our pianists, Tycho Palick, who mm -hmm. has worked with us quite a bit, she's actually going to be our choral director. So she's going to take on the choral music and the conducting of the whole piece. Wonderful. So we're very excited about that. And where will the auditions be held? They're going to be at the Veterans Park Event Center, which is where the city graciously gives us a room. We do our auditions there as well as our rehearsals. And the veterans are so sweet to let us use the large room there uh, to, to do our work there. And the auditions are the 10th and the 12th. And August 10th is a Thursday, they're from 7 to 10, and August the 12th, Saturday from 10 to 1. And like I said, if folks go online and it looks like they're full, just come on in at the audition times, because we would like to give everyone a chance. There, we're going to have a choreographer too, uh, lots of dance numbers. Megan Stewart, who's done a lot of work for us, is just wonderful at getting everyone in dance numbers. So if you don't want to sing, if you're not necessarily an actor, we certainly need dancers as well. And you could use some volunteers as well if they would like to help in other areas, couldn't oh, you? Oh, we always need volunteers, yes ma'am, to help uh, with ushers at the theater, uh, to help with the art show, working on that. Any project that we have, if you'll contact us, we would love to have volunteers. Of course, we're a nonprofit, so we encourage memberships to help us along, and also our board of directors. We'd love if folks are really interested in being a part of the community to contact me about uh, bec becoming a board member. And who is the president of your board this year? Debbie Dobbs is our president this year. And she's been involved in so many of the productions and hands-on operations as well, hasn't she? Yes, she has. Yes. Well, it sounds like you have an exciting future for us for the arts and we're really looking forward to that. And uh, when you mentioned auditions there at the Veterans Center, for those who aren't familiar, you might tell them what it's next door to. Oh yeah, if you can find the Grand Prairie Memorial Library, you can find the Veterans Park Event Center just next door, and they've actually put a large cannon out in front of it now, and there's gonna be a few more things added. So right next door to the library, you can't miss it. Thank you so much, Libby. This sounds very exciting, and we're looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Georgia. Yes. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Georgia Clemson, reminding you that it's happening in Grand Prairie.